Hi, I'm Mark Goodfellow. I'm the lead elder of Church on the Way. I want to introduce us as a church to you, who we are. I want to tell you that we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we want to make him known throughout the earth. We want to work with God the Holy Spirit as he leads us and guides us in endeavoring to do this. We want to just tell you that we're a family that works together. We're united as one. We're on a journey to fulfill the purposes of God in our life. And we encourage you as we have this pioneering heart to, to go to the nations and to preach this gospel, not only in our, our nation of South Africa, but the nations of the earth, to reach out with the good news that we find in Jesus Christ. So in this process, we really do believe that we are a church on the go. We're on this journey, this adventure together. We don't have all the answers, but we do know who has the answer, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. So come and join us as we work together and we work on this journey to fulfill his plans and purposes for our lives. God bless you. Good morning, uh, Church on the Way, and anyone who's joining, and even to those who might watch this later on YouTube. This uh, message has been uh, um, stirring in me for some time as I've uh, read many scriptures and the Lord has been laying on my heart that we need to, uh, we need to get ready and we need to understand where we are. So um, the message this morning uh, is titled Signs of the Fig Tree. And today I want to ask, answer or try to answer three questions. Where are we today? And what is the big picture? And then so what? Once we, once we understand all this, so what? What do we do with it? What is our response? Um, the main text for today, I want to read the bulk of uh, Matthew 24. I believe in reading scripture, and then we will look at um, particular verses. The parallel passages which carry the same message is in Mark 13, verse 3 to 37, and Luke 21, verse 5 to 38. So reading then from uh, Matthew 24, I've uh, got a number of references from NIV and the New Living Translation today. This one uh, we'll read from the NIV. The heading of the passage is the destruction of the temple and signs of the end times. Now, if you can picture, if you have seen... Um, uh, uh, Jerusalem on a map and the Mount of Olives across a valley um, and this is where the disciples are sitting as they talk to Jesus about this so they left the temple and uh, so Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings and he said do you see all these things he asked truly I tell you not one stone will be left on another everyone will be thrown down as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives then, just across from Jerusalem, the disciples called to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Even their question is uh, quite telling. They didn't understand how when we read it today, what it would mean. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning birth pains. And then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm till the end will be saved. And just hear that word from Sally this morning, which is directly in line with this passage. Will I find favor on earth? Uh, Jesus says elsewhere. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. 
So you see, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through um, through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand that let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down and take anything out of the house. Let no, uh, no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. I pray that your, your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world till now. Never to be equaled again. That's a key verse. If those days had not been cut short, no one would uh, survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At the time, if at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders and deceive, um, to deceive, if possible, the elect. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you he's out there in the wilderness, do not go out. If he's here in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east, is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, um, the, the vultures will gather. Immediately after the stress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. They Then will appear the Son of Man in heaven, and, the, and, and all the peoples on the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as the twig gets tender, its leaves come out, you know that it is summer, that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, nor the Son, but, the, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Another relevant verse. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other one left. I want to skip down there. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour the Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known the time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is faith? Who then is the faithful wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them food at the proper time? It will be good for the servant who, who, uh, whose master finds him doing so when he returns, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that we, that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at the hour he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, these are your very words spoken to your disciples who penned it and is now in the Gospels for us to, to read and meditate on. And Father, we pray that this, the weight of what you need to say to us today, and what you need to want to impart to us today by your spirit would be revelation to us. And that, Father, some of the things, even for me, as you've exposed this, Lord, you've, you've opened my eyes to new things I never saw before. And I pray for each one of us, Lord, that this, this message about the fig tree that you have placed in the word, 
And you repeated it three times in the Gospels so that it is so important that we understand because your heart is for us to be ready. Your heart is for us to be available and to be willing to do your work. So, Father, I pray that as we go through this, you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts not to be hardened and to and to hear in Jesus' name. So, I want to ask the question, where are we today? What did the Lord, that being the Father and Jesus, say? Because there is a sense that when you look at history, we get lulled, like that verse said, that my master is staying away a long time. This thing of the second coming of Christ is, is, is a way off. And, and we fall prey to the enemy's distractions of, of this thing, of it's a long time. We look at the date when we write it every day, 2021. We think, well, it's been 2,000 years since Christ. So I want to look and, and, and share with you what, what uh, the Lord showed me to go to that passage that we just read, and we're going to unpack it and see what did Jesus say about these signs of the fig tree and what is our world like today? Because Jesus' intention with that passage was that we actually go and look and see so that we can recognize the signs and not just ignore the passage. So when we zoom out, um, we can then see what some of these lessons are. So I've actually done this and, and taken every single aspect of that passage and there's some other prophecies that we'll go into and i pray that although i think the message will be a bit longer today that it will stir our hearts and open our eyes to see what jesus is saying through this passage today so extracting then um verse 33 32 and 33 now learn the lesson from the fig tree um on the right there you see a fig tree um not sure where it is i think it is one in israel that i managed to 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 find um and as soon as its twigs get tender and the leaves come out, you know summer is near. Jesus' intention with his word, verse is, let us check which twigs are getting tender, as it were, in this parable of the fig tree or this parallel of the fig tree. And he says in verse 36, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So the I'm going to spin through these quite quickly because we're going to go through each one. What did Jesus say? This is a list of what Jesus said are the signs of the fig tree. There will be false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, which is tribes like genocides, earthquakes. And with earthquakes, you could put volcanoes because they're very closely linked as uh, the tectonic plates uh, uh, move. Famines, birth pains. These are waves of increasing intensity. If we just ask the ladies on the group who have given natural birth, they will tell us. Us men don't know anything. Um, but these are waves. So liken what we're seeing to these waves. Even COVID-19 is yet another one of these little waves coming in. Um, persecution, increase of wickedness. Love of most will grow cold. Apostasy, the falling away. And that is, unfortunately, it's also it's a sign of those people who knew the truth and this is the saddest cry, I think, from one of the signs today that stirs our hearts to do something about it um, because the devil is taking people away. The gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. Jesus is quite clear. All of these things and then the end will come. And we would be naive not to understand then what these things actually mean. Um, at the end, we will unpack it a bit. There are more than one there's more than one end and i think sometimes us as believers are not that well versed in what the end really looks like so uh, let's understand that and the days have been shortened that's another caution that i found that alerts us to the fact that we have less time than we think because the days were shortened and and jesus's final word after all of these warnings i have told you you being the church ahead of time it's like when parents tell their kids I told you, you're going to hurt yourself, and then it happens. And this is Jesus' words to us as his believers. I've told you ahead of time. It's, 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 he's crying out for us to listen to this passage and the parallel ones. So, the first one, the false messiahs. I looked it up. 
and I could find references to these six men, which I don't want to draw attention to, but look where they came from. The Philippines, Australia, Russia, New Mexico, Brazil, Miami, all of these people. And number six on the list, I think he's still alive, claiming that they are the Messiah. And, and, and people are flocking to them and following them in spite of the very warnings in, in, the, in the scripture. As we look now, I've, I've researched a lot of these, each and every single one of these aspects to find what is happening in the world and what has happened as far back as I can go to find the data. Much of the data I've actually prepared myself from the raw data. And so these graphs like this one are, are graphs that I have prepared and presented from the data I could find. Britannica listed the number of wars that have happened throughout history. So when I charted them like this, it starts to make uh, uh, a very good case for the fact that Jesus said there were wars and rumors of wars, and these are the signs. If we are, we would be blind to see that from 1300 BC until uh, our current century, the data that I got, whoops, the data that I got um, was uh, up till uh, mid um, 20th century. So that's why it tap tapers off there, I think. But as you can see, that is a massive escalation in the number of wars over the time. When we zoom back, because we didn't live that long, um, you know, the Lord says we are like a, a, a breath uh, of, of air. Um, we, we're a vapor. Our lives are like a vapor. And so we get so fixated on our time scale that we forget that, that the way the, wor the, the world is looked at by the Lord is from a much longer time frame. And, and there you can see the wars. Nation rising against nation. These are this is a history of genocides. Now, to understand the scale here, I'll try and use my mouse to point here if you can see it. Um, this 400 is 400 times 100,000 people dying per year. So that's actually 40 million people. So at the peak here in the 1940s and 50s, three different genocides, 40 million people were killed because of this thing of nation rising against nation. And what, what surprised me was that we all know about the Rwanda genocide, but it's, it's kind of paled into insignificance in, re, in, re, in relation to, to what's happened. That then, if you've seen that uh, um, uh, memorial in Rwanda, as I know Mark has, I've been there, it, it's, it's shocking that that, that that is still small on the scale of what's happened in our recent history. In the 19th or in the 20th century, this is a graph um, from our world in data. What it shows is great powers that have been fighting with each other every year since 1500 till 2015. The data goes up to, and as you can see, the percentage of um, uh, the wars that would be fought, the percentage of years in which great powers were fighting with one another. There's been continuous wars from the 1500, and these are, 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 are listed here. But my, my, my intention is not to go too much into detail, otherwise we'll be here till lunchtime. So the Lord said there will be wars and rumors of wars. And what we can see is that has definitely happened and is still happening today. And then there'll be earthquakes. Now, this is a chart of the earthquakes that have happened since the 1900s. Uh, every year and only the ones with eight magnitude and above just to put your mind in perspective that great tsunami that hit uh, the um, the Asian coast back in 2004 that was a magnitude nine earthquake out at sea that caused that and so these are on that scale and you can see in the in the in the 2000s and in our recent decade more than 24 massive earthquakes have happened and then another chart of these, just so you can see, this was um, uh, um, courtesy of the United States uh, uh, General uh, USGS. Um, from 1970 to 2005, this graph goes up to, as you can see, slowly increasing. But look at the scale there too. These are 4,000 earthquakes. These are now including all earthquakes from magnitude 4 up to 9.9. .9. And so, as you can see, the wars are increasing. The word is not that there will be. It, it's this, the sense that they will be increasing that we get from the word. This is another timeline that I found 
which um, extends that timeline from 20, 20, 2005. As you can see, that other graph above ends over here, where there's relatively infrequent large earthquakes. But if you look going beyond that, now going beyond 20, 2005, up to our recent history, 2015 about there, um, the increase in large magnitude earthquakes is significant. And so what I've found is courtesy of the Smithsonian Institute, a timeline. If you look on the bottom of your screen, you'll see the year advancing. This is a video. It's about a 30 second video. And you can see over the years, the earthquakes. Now, the what you're looking at is the size of the circles indicates the, the magnitude. The little flickering everywhere, if your data is allowing you to see that manual, the granularity, is the number of earthquakes happening over time. And now you can see these large um, uh, orange uh, bursts. These are from volcanoes I I erupting with sulfur dioxide being spewed into the air. And the, 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 the size of it is the magnitude of these things increasing. And this is, we still only in the 89s, as you saw just now, that graph went up to the 2015, somewhere around there. And as you see, as this graph gets further and further, you will see that the um, these magnitudes are increasing. So, so the earthquakes that the Bible prophesies about are happening more and more and faster and faster. Um, and now we're in the 2000s, and you'll see in the last snippet of this video how they also rapidly increase. Just watch how the the um, the number of of, of um, events occurring now bring this into into a reality. And um, this goes up to uh, what is about 2018. There you go. And so then when we look at it over time, that's what it looks like from 1960 to now. These are significant in terms of the fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus said, this is a sign and he's warned us ahead of time. So we look at the sign and then we understand what Jesus is saying because he's actually given us these things as the signs. Volcanoes linked to earthquakes, um, I've listed them as I found them by country. And you can see that Russia and the United States and um, Iran and these countries have had significant uh, earthquakes. That's the number of volc uh, 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 volcanoes, I mean, uh, in the year. But now if we switch to graphing this over time in terms of the volcanoes, this is kind of what we've seen in that video from the 1800s through to the 20th century. So when we zoom out more and more, we start to understand what God was saying. God was prophesying this in the year of Daniel back in 1000 BC. And now we look 3000 years later, what is happening in the fulfillment of this prophecy? And this one is the most shocking. I found data on volcanoes up to and including 2021, our very year that we are only two months into. And if you look on the right, I've actually put an arrow to show you that in 2021, we have had 45 earthquakes in less than two months, more than double what we had in the whole of last year. If you can see, it's small, but there's last year, okay, and, and going down. So you can see this radical increase in the number of volcanoes that have been erupting. And this is dated back to 10,000 BC. I know our understanding of creation goes back to about 6,000 BC when, when Adam and Eve came. But um, dating these things, uh, we understand that the earth can be older than that. And look, there is almost nothing happening in terms of the volcanoes that were found. And it's not that man could record these things, but that found these on earth and traced the trace elements back to date them, which has formed this chart. And again, this is the, uh, uh, um, the general surveyor from the US data that I've graphed. Then Jesus said there will be famines. These are, this is a chart of the famines by year from 9, 1860 to 2016. And what you can see here is the extent of the people that have died from famines. It's not so much accelerated in our recent century, but when you look at it in terms of this happening, literally less than about 100 to 120 years, um, back to about less than 100 years ago, 50 years ago. We were looking at, at these famines that have to grip the world uh, globally and taken many lives. Pestilences and plagues. 
uh, I looked up the definition of a pestilence and I found fascinating that actually the bubonic plague is used as a definition of a pestilence itself, uh, but ironic. But um, it comes from the UK, this word, back in, in the day, obviously. And it, it's, it's a deadly or virulent epidemic disease, bubonic plague, something that is considered harmful, destructive or evil. And what I was fascinated to see is if you look at disease, in heaven there is no disease. Disease is, is a state of the fallen earth. And, and the, the, the absolute magnitude in 2017, which is the, where the data is from, which is in our recent history, how many people are dying from these things? These are pestilences. Uh, cardiovascular disease tops the charts, which I literally discovered uh, when I saw my um, um, cardio surgeon this week for my follow-up appointment, where he said it is one of the largest uh, killers. And um, if you add that and respiratory diseases and those sort of things to it, you get to on the top there nearly 30, 25 to 30 million people from these kind of pestilences and plagues. So I found this 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 chart from uh, a site called the Visual Capitalist, and it's a long one, so I've split it across two slides. This is just the timeline of some of these pandemics coming through the ages. Going back to 165 AD um, and even before, and if you look, the bubonic plague uh, was topping the list there in the 1300s, uh, in the 14th century, and, and smallpox is close on its heels. And HIV AIDS, uh, these things of our latest um, history have not really um, taken as many people, but I will show you just now what, what is really alarming. Um, this is the uh, scale of magnitude of the different plagues and pestilences over time that was prophesied by Jesus. If you look down there, our little COVID-19 that's caused such upheaval in the world is only so far, obviously, at the time of um, uh, producing this, which is uh, 2020, uh, February, uh, the 1st of February, uh, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, 2.2 uh, million. But um, the interesting thing is when you count the number of pestilences that have come and not just looking at the death tolls but if you count the number of pestilences we see this graph and it looks awfully familiar compared to the graph that we looked at when we looked at the earthquakes when we looked at volcanoes and other things and so what you see is the number of pestilences and plagues is is radically increasing and the, in the last um, uh, um, uh, decade or so we've had 10, whereas there's literally only been one particular plague or pestilence through these historic ages, and many of them actually nothing, nothing really happening. It's from 500 BC to 2000 AD. And then you look at persecution. So persecution is where Christians who profess the faith uh, and, 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 and claim the blood of Jesus as their salvation. Um, I'm not talking about uh, Christians who perhaps just write it on a census form and don't really know what they're writing. But these are Christians who profess the faith and are fighting the fight that Jesus told them they would fight. And if you look, the persecution across much of the uh, inhabited globe, uh, I don't know how many millions of people have, uh, would, would be represented as being uh, living in those, in those areas, but this is, this is where you can see um, communism is rife and 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 other religions are quite virulent uh, against uh, Christian believers and then the increase of wickedness now this was fascinating to see uh, how do you measure wickedness well I went to prison stats and I found some stats here um, as mentioned from the criminal justice statistics from 1925 to 2001. This is the number of people that have been put in prison in the last um, decade, uh, last uh, century, sorry. Um, and as you can see, it's a radical increase. And this chart stops at 2001. So, um, and this is a per 100,000 population. Then, if you look at some more recent stats, this is dated around uh, 2018, 2019, you can see that from 2002 to 2018, there was a 20% increase in the number of people that were in global prisons. This is global prisons. 
8 million to 11 million. Is wickedness increasing? I would say so. 700,000 women in prison. That's a 50% increase since the year 2000. 410,000 children in detention facilities and 1 million in police custody. So even children are being deceived by the enemy. And there's 19,000 kids living with their mothers in prison. If you look on the right there, you'll see, um, let me move this and I can look a bit more at you. Um, half a million people serving life sentences. That's an increase of 84%. And a life sentence would be kind of a measure of extreme wickedness. 20,000 people on death row. And if you look at the crimes that are being committed, this thing of drugs is, is taking the world by storm. And much of the offenses have increased in that area. Apostasy. So there will be a falling away. And I managed to find some, some data from an organization called Pew Research, which obviously surveys. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I can't claim that, that everyone on this chart is, is, is Christian, as we understand, to be a believer in the Lord. But if you start to deny it, even at that point, in terms of a survey, you can start to see the trend. So till about uh, 2015, 2019, uh, it was, uh, I've done it in five year jumps. Uh, you can see that the decline of Christianity uh, is taking place. And by converse, the increase of those people who claim to have no religion. So those two graphs are basically a vivid depiction of what we can see, a fulfillment of the word that many, the love of most will grow cold. And it is accelerating, unfortunately. Then Jesus said the gospel will be preached in all nations. And I think sometimes we have misunderstood the scripture because we actually have translated it to be that the world will be saved. And Jesus didn't say that. He said they will hear the gospel. Whether they hear and don't listen to it, that's a different story. But he said they will hear. So I try to find, and I found this data that says, where has the gospel been preached? Doesn't necessarily mean, I know that actually is showing by the darkness of the chart of how much of that population claims to be Christian. But if you see, there are very few light gray areas where there's no data or people, no, uh, no people claim to have possibly heard the gospel. But I think that these charts, these areas and these countries have definitely heard the gospel. So pretty much we could say that the world has heard the gospel. Whether they've listened to the gospel is a different matter, but Jesus said it will be heard. So Jesus says here, I've, to, I've warned you, I've told you, learn about the signs from the fig tree. See, I've warned you about this ahead of time. So we would be naive to ignore what is highlighted in the scriptures. And I've seen how of late God is speaking through his church to bring this urgency about it and even unraveling and understanding some of these prophecies in the old times where Daniel's prophecies were said seal it up until the end people are starting to put that together now this is the time of the end Jesus also said in that passage as in the days of Noah what happened in the days of Noah um, it will be at the coming of the son of man picture Noah if you like um, he was he was building his ark and he was um, doing that for about 75 to, uh, or 56 to 75 years, they say. I mean, some people say about 100 years. But can you imagine living where this guy is building this massive ship? No one's ever seen a thing like that. It, it, you can't think that it would float. Makes no sense. And yet, for 75 years, not one of them turned their hearts to the Lord to understand Maybe we should be like Noah until, as the verse says, until the, 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 the waters, the flood waters came and they knew nothing about it until the very minute they were um, destroyed. And Jesus is saying that's what it's going to be like in this time. So there's a huge sounding to say we need to be ready. We need to understand that this is what uh, has been prophesied. And in and, and the days of Noah is, is, is such a caution to us. Um, sorry, I'm juggling the screens here. Um, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. So we are warned to keep watch. 
and Matthew 24, 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Verse 44 says, so you must also be ready when the Son of Man comes because you don't know the hour. And the, 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 the verse 50 says, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he's not aware. So if any of us think that we know and we are ready, all we can do is wait like the ten virgins and hope that we are the five that are ready and not the five that are thinking that we're ready and actually um, anticipate what God is saying. Because uh, many people kind of dismiss these passages because there's a lot of talk about end time in, in, in the word. And, um, and and we can be lulled into, into um, ignoring it. So what did Daniel say? I want to pick up just a couple of things from there. Daniel 9, 24 to 27 says, keep watch, uh, uh, but you, Daniel, keep this prophecy as a secret. Seal the book up until the time of the end, which is where I believe we are now, in that vicinity. When many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. So it's another fig tree sign in a sense because Jesus himself referred to Daniel's prophecy. So that is another powerful thing to me that Jesus himself referred to Daniel's prophecies. It wasn't this part that he referred to, but the overall prophecies of Daniel, Jesus knew about. But what did Daniel get told? And this is, remember, he's being told this by an angel from heaven who's giving him another, another uh, a few signs. They will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. And this is, this is a really scary part. Sealed uh, until the end, or the wicked will not understand. They will continue and not understand, as in the days of Noah. And what is happening today, we've got LGBT agendas, Black Lives Matter, and all of these people um, and organizations. And this is the wicked who are refusing to listen to the gospel. And it's our job to, to try and reach them because the Lord's heart is for those people who are being deceived by the enemy. So what did Daniel talk about? He talked about rushing here and there. So have the, has the world increased in rushing here and there? One of the biggest metrics you could probably look at is world, global travel. I found this chart from our world in data, which shows the number of travelers by, by the year increasing. And this is off the charts. And this is actually also a tourism channel travel. So I'm, I'm imagining that maybe they didn't include business travel here, but nonetheless, the picture is clear that in 1950, you would never have been able to say, or before that, that the world was rushing here and there. But certainly by the current time we live in, we can say that the world is rushing here and there, like was prophesied in Daniel. Another chart here shows the number of international arrivals in 2016. And if you just look at the shading there, uh, which are countries from say 30 million to 90 million arriving in a year, you can see that much of this world, the same parts of the world to a degree that were rejecting the gospel, but um, pretty much the entire globe is traveling here and there. And that, that would be a fulfillment of that. And then he said, knowledge will increase. Now, are we seeing an increase in knowledge? Well, these slides will, you can draw your own conclusions. If you just look at the knowledge economy, this is graphed by these countries and by their GDP per capita. So these are countries that are generating significant wealth from knowledge. If knowledge wasn't increasing, they wouldn't be generating that wealth. And so you can see there is a, there is a massive increase across the world of this, this, this benefits of, of, of knowledge. This chart, I know that there's a lot of small writing on there, but I will talk about some, some of the things on here so you can see. Um, you can see the timeline, and this is from uh, before time, and the population, as you can see, the gray bar along the bottom is uh, 1 billion people. When we stretched, when we uh, exited the, the 1 billion mark and started to grow, that was around the 1800s um, in the 19th century. And the population has exploded. But with that, the knowledge and the inventions, you've got things like if I just pick off a few, Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, the iPad in 2010. Uh, one of the last ones there is um, human genome sequencing. We just have to look at the latest vaccines that are out for, for the virus, which have never been developed uh, using DNA uh, to be woven into a, a virus, uh, in, into a vaccine. So this is 
knowledge increasing. And as someone actually said, if you pick up your phone today, you've got Google and other search engines in your pocket and almost everything known to man, as I've just proven here because I found these stats in not too long a time, the knowledge has increased radically. And this was staggering to me. If you just look at this, um, for those people who are not PC literate, don't worry. I will unpack it for you quickly. One megabyte could be represented like a tiny ant, um, according to this, uh, this chap, Julian Carver, who, who did this in New Zealand. Today, PCs, we talk about a gig. You have a memory stick. Uh, my phone has got 256 gigs of RAM. Um, so, so when you go from an ant, which can store a certain amount of data, to a gigabyte, it's the same as an ant becoming a human being. That is significant orders of magnitude a thousand times. And then when we go to the terabyte, which is pretty much what most companies have, a couple of terabytes of data on their standard service, so that's not even big data. Then it's like going from the height of a person to the length of the Auckland Bridge. And then when we go beyond that, where we go into pentabytes. Now, when you look at the data stored by Google and by Apple and by Microsoft and these companies, their servers in the world will have pentabytes and beyond. Now, when you go from a terabyte to a pentabyte, it's the same scale as going from the Auckland Harbour Bridge to the full length of New Zealand. We started at an ant, people. And then when we go beyond that to an exabyte, um, and that's two thirds of the annual production information, then we are at the diameter of the sun. And this is an explosion of knowledge that is a fulfillment of the prophecy, knowledge will increase. Isaiah said, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, um, and that dark is light and light is dark. And that's another thing that's happening in the world today is that many people are calling good evil and evil good. And they are fighting for rights even in churches to, to do gay marriages and things like that um, and claiming these things are right. So Paul's warnings, I'm going to fly through these quite quickly because there's a long list, but um, oops, that was a, a duplicated slide. So this is in his letter to Timothy, which you can read in, uh, and we won't read it now, but 2 Timothy 3, go and read 2 Timothy 3. I read it from the New Living Translation because it expounded us a few things better. But he says to Timothy, in the end times, and, and you can just think as I read this, I haven't drawn graphs on all of these. There will be difficult times. I think COVID has shown us that with a huge ec economic disaster that followed that thing. It wasn't so much the pestilence, but the fallout from it. They will love themselves. They will love money. They will be boastful, proud. They'll scoff at God. How many people disrespect God? They'll disobedient to their parents. We've got laws today that protect the, this, this, this disobedience. Ungrateful. Consider nothing as sacred. Unloving. Unforgiving. The slander of others. No self-control. There's practically an explosion of that in the world as people just give in to the sinful desire, desires. People will be cruel. Hate what is good like the Isaiah passage. Betray friends. They'll be reckless, puffed up with pride. They'll be lovers of pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious. Reject the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus who have victory over evil. Women will follow new teachings other than biblical. They're women's right and women's lib and, and many of these organizations have come out professing these new theories. Depraved minds. Counterfeit faith, those who uh, want to live godly will suffer persecution. The evil will prosper and imposters will prosper. People won't listen to sound and wholesome teaching and they'll follow their own desires. They'll find teachers who tell them what they want to hear and they'll reject the truth and they'll chase after myths. Wow, that is an, ex an extension of the list that Jesus gave us as the signs. And now if you add these to the signs that Paul, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, gave us, we can see that these things are, are um, happening. I know we are short on time, but let's, I'm almost uh, finished with part one. Part two and three won't be that long. So I want to look at just some things of 
events in Revelation, prophesied in Revelation. Now, just hear me in this. I'm not saying these things are here today. So don't say Quinton said that we've got the mark of the beast and all this. But you need to understand because these are more signs of the fig tree. We have had them prophesied in Scripture. We know they're coming in the tribulation. And what are they? And would there be some evidence of that already being available in the world today? So signs of imminent fulfillment of some revelation events. Revelation 13, 16 to 70 talks about that people will be forced and everyone's fixated on this and that there's stuff in the vaccine and stuff like that. I don't believe there is. But is the technology here today that that actually um, could uh, be, be a fulfillment of this? And yes, there is. They have already invented, and this is back in 2014, a microchip that has a little battery in it that charges from the change in temperature in your skin. That they did research that cost a million dollars to find out that it could be implanted in the head or in the right hand. And then horror of horrors, you go and look at what the scripture says. So the technology that is needed for the mark of the beast is already in the world today. That scared me because it, it made me realize it was a wake up. Okay. Um, and there he's holding it in his hand. And you can see there's a company where they're busy in, uh, putting it in, in a person. So certain companies, you can go and check it out. And on the detailed notes that uh, can be shared um, that Robbie will put up, then you will see some more of the details and the links to these. Revelation events. In Revelation 8 verse 8 and 8 verse 10, it talks about a huge mountain that was ablaze thrown into the sea. And in 8 verse 10, a great star fell like a burning torch. These are things that are going to happen in the future. But what I looked at, what I was horrified at is, could those things have been detected by man already that could potentially actually be these events? And yes, they are. What you're seeing on the screen there is an actual photo from um, a, a, a meteorite or a, an asteroid that came in and literally exploded in the sky. And that's a small one. This is one that's called uh, a POFUS. It's 300 and something meters wide. And this is its passing of the Earth that is predicted by man at the moment on the 13th of April, 2029. They say that it's going to come within the satellite ranges of the Earth, which if you look at the size of the galaxy, is like missing us by a hair. But um, they also predict that one in 37 chance that this could hit the Earth. I don't think it will, but the fact is, these things are happening out there and we're oblivious to it. To just visualize what would it be like if an object one kilometer wide was hurtling towards the Earth, this is, a, I suppose, an artist's impression. These are the things that are prophesied, the terrible things that Jesus said in the passage we read just now, um, Matthew 24, that it will be uh, a terrible times, unequaled from the beginning and will never, ever be equaled again. What Jesus was saying is the seven year tribulation is the worst years that will ever be in the history of mankind. It will be those seven years. And I believe those are close at hand. The... Um, Potential impacts. This is the sum of potential impacts. You can see in 2052, there's a possible 475 uh, asteroid impacts. And I've highlighted the one I've just shown you, Apophis. Although it's only a handful of uh, um, um, asteroids, it circles the Earth about every uh, uh, few years. And as you can see, those are the two passings of Earth. And every time, according to the predictions, it's getting closer and closer. But that's more into the future. If you look here at the size of these things, um, 350 meters odd wide, they've detected a POFUS. It was found in 2014 in the skies. And in 20, uh, 2800, so that's long into the future, there's one hurtling out there in space, 1.3 kilometers wide. That would probably annihilate the Earth. But the fact is, these things are out there, and I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom this morning, but I'm just trying to say the Lord is saying to us, wake up. So what is the big picture? The big picture is this, and this is a, a, a one slide I've put together to, to really just understand what these end time events look like, because I even myself was unaware of some of these aspects. And if you want to go and look at some passages, go and read those ones at the top there, Daniel 7. 
uh, Zechariah 12 and 14 and Isaiah 2. These are all prophesying the day of the Lord. But this day is a little bit more complex than just um, a phrase like that. So when Jesus uh, was crucified and died for our sins in about 30 AD, we start the timeline. And the white indicates um, heaven and the black indicates separation from God or hell or judgment and, um, and the timeline there. So if we took it today, if we were raptured today, we would have roughly uh, uh, just under 2,000 years of, um, of church age. And this is what the, 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 is called the church age and what Jesus spoke about. In that time, when believers die, they are taken up to um, heaven, but to essentially sleep with God. And I'll show you that um, from Daniel. Go and read the last verse of Daniel. You will see what the angel tells Daniel. He tells him, too, that he will be like those. Um, and then, wrong verse. And then those who reject Jesus, this is a rejection. They fall into um, uh, 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 this judgment or separation from God. At the uh, point of the rapture, which is... Um, I want to find the verse now. In, um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18, we see that um, Jesus says he will be coming in the clouds. He doesn't actually return to earth. And what happens is the dead in Christ will rise first. Dead in Christ will rise first. And we will be caught up with him in the clouds to meet him. So we are taken out of the earth, much like Noah was taken out, much like Lot and Abraham were taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah to avoid the destruction that was to come. We spend seven years in paradise, and those who rejected Jesus will spend seven years in tribulation. The years described as the worst ever by Jesus in the history known to the world. And when that time ends, this is the Armageddon and all of those things that happen. There's, we can't even unpack all of that now. This is literally just a summary so we can see. Then we reign with Christ for a thousand years here in Jerusalem, as Jesus, uh, uh, as, as the scriptures uh, teach. And Christ reigns with the believers. So the key is, if you look at Hebrews 3 verse 13, and I put that verse onto the, uh, the, the, the going group on Friday, because actually, amazingly enough, how it tied in with this um, as I was reading it. But it says, as you have uh, the time today, make these decisions. This is what is called today. We've got a window of time before all these things happen. And the urgency is, in a sense, what are we going to do about us approaching this time? And I believe this time could be near. Jesus said it's close as at the door. And the fig tree signs are pointing to the fact that we don't know if it's a year, 10 years, or even 30 years, but it doesn't matter. The, the fact is, the Lord wants us to be about his business and, and to become urgent. And if you look at the seven letters to the churches of Revelation, these are charted across time um, that, that, that the church ages that we went through match up with the warnings in the in the letters and i'm going to speed through this quickly just to show you that each letter ties up to a time in, in church history um, and when you get to the Laodicea letter you will notice that it is charted at the time of 1900 to whenever the rapture occurs jesus doesn't tell us all he tells us is it's coming and and that many will be deceived and and, and this is another caution that I see is so important for us to understand that the time is now and we have no idea. All we know is what happens in the seven years and what happens at the end. But when that seven years starts, that's the thing Jesus is saying. No one knows the day or the hour when that will happen. And that could be this year. It could be next year. But we need to live with the reality like Jesus said. We need to be watching. We need to be expecting. Could Jesus be back today? Could he be back this month? Could he be back this year? And what will change in our lifestyle um, if we understand that? This is a timeline that I put together um, just for us to see these things. Um, as you can see here, we have the potential of being raptured at any time. 
And then um, if it were to happen now, then you'd have the millennial reign from uh, 2028. Paul said to the Thessalonians um, that uh, these things are coming. He warned and he said um, at the end of that passage in verse 18, he says, so encourage and one another with his words. What are those words? We who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, and um, Daniel is told, as for you, go your way until the end, which is after tribulation, and you will rest. That's what I was saying when I put that chart up, until that time. And at the end of these days, the tribulation and Armageddon, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance, which is what we are also standing in faith about. So what? What is this all about? And I know I've gone a little bit over time, but please forgive me and hang in there because I believe this is important. So there's my, yeah, here we go. Um, so what? Why is this important? As we look at the buds of the fig tree, Matthew 24 verse 33 said, so when you see all these signs, you know that, the, it, that, that it is right at the door. Jesus uses that word, so, when you see the signs. That's why I said, so what? Um, Romans 13, 11 to 14 is a call to wake up. And that the, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. And this is the day that that Hebrews passage is talking about in Hebrews 3, verse 12 to 14. And that says, um, warn each other whilst it is still today you must warn each other every day while it is still today and that's what i'm doing today folk for myself and for you i'm warning us that jesus said it is today the day of, of warning that none of us will be deceived and sin and hardened against god so it's twofold bringing believers in and trying to reach those who have hardened themselves against God because of the deception of the enemy in the end times. And if you look, Noah built his ark, as I said, uh, but nobody heeded for 75 to 100 year warning while there was this massive ark standing as a testimony that something is maybe up. There's a bit strange. Matthew 24, 45 to 46, it'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing, doing so when he returns. What is he doing so? doing what we are called to do. In other words, being a faithful servant, not lounging around and, 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 and doing whatever we, we, we feel that is more focused on this world than the world to come. And John 4, 35 to 36, there is little time. We need to get an eternal perspective. Um, it says there, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up, look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit of their harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. And we are warned about these things. Revelation 3 verse 5 says, I will not blot out your name of the book of life. And we can get into that uh, um, on another study. But ultimately, I believe that 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 blotting out comes from those who at the final day, when they breathe their last, did they reject Jesus or not? And if they rejected Jesus and his offer, they will be blotted out and not found in the book of life. In Luke 6, 47 to 49, um, one who hears and does not put into practice um, and, the, and, the, and the one who hears and does put into practice, we are warned about that by Jesus himself. And lastly, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, the enemy does not sleep. He is always looking who he can steal, kill, and devour. So while we focus on these things that Jesus has mentioned, we realize that the enemy is also against us winning this battle. It's against us understanding, even challenging your minds as I'm talking right now, that now, Quentin, you're talking rubbish. This is not as, as, as urgent. This is not really... We don't need to react to this now. You're being a bit uh, over the top. And that is the enemy wanting to steal the word. And so our response to Jesus, Matthew 24, Jesus says things. 
He says, the signs of the fig tree, observe them. We must understand them. We must hear what he said. We must believe in your heart. And then we need to act. Become an active believer. Reading the word. Spreading the word. Praying for the sick. Casting out demons. Raising the dead. Being fishers of men. Time is short. The day of the Lord that I've shown you is right at the door. So what is our response? And I've got three R's for you. The first one, for some, there'll be an element of repentance. Lord, you know, I'm not really about your business. I am not that sold out to you. I am distracted by the things of the world. Yes, I'm a believer, but maybe I'm one of those that in areas I'm growing cold. I'm not pushing in with you. I don't have a spiritual diet of scripture. In those areas, in any area that the Holy Spirit will prompt you now, I believe we need to repent. Say, Lord, you know what? This is a warning. Jesus, when he said, see the signs, it's like that aha moment. Oh, now I understand what the sign means. That is a reaction that causes repentance. Let me change what I was doing before where I was ignoring the signs and let me get about the Lord's business and, and get busy. For others, it'll be to be radical. Maybe we need to step up the game and become more fervent. And for others still, who I believe need our prayers, people will reject this message. People do reject it every day. They're about all their affairs. If you just look at the increase of evil in the world that we looked at already, there will be those who reject. And that's where we need to become active. Because once we have received this, the Lord says, then are you about my business? So it's not just about getting this message for yourself. Ah, I'm okay. I will be raptured when Jesus comes. Because actually, you will be like the 10 virgins of the five who weren't ready. Because it's not just about us getting this message for ourselves. But once we get this for ourselves, we're supposed to do something with it. So our response. What is your response today? Thank you, Ivan. I don't know if you...